this time on Psychic Investigators. In Napa Valley, two young women are stabbed to death in their home. Large amounts of blood, just horrendous. A third roommate survives. In a few minutes' time, my entire life was changed. How could this happen in our Napa? Police have the forensics, but no one to tie it to. Who am I missing? Who did I forget? What am I overlooking? A psychic says, look closer to home. They knew this person. There was no question about it. Napa Valley, the heart of California's idyllic wine country. A place of vineyards, breathtaking views, the good life, and if nothing else, a safe place to live. And then, Halloween 2004. This is only an emergency. What are you reporting? Oh my God, we got attacked. Who attacked you? I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay. Most of my roommates were hurt. Oh my God. When the police arrive at the house on Dorset Street, they find two women dead. The scene is so gruesome, a female officer feels ill and has to leave. More police descend on the house. The homicides had occurred in the upstairs of the residence. As we approached the staircase, there was uh, an enormous amount of blood. Detective Kirk Primo was a 14-year veteran with the Napa Police Department. Not wanting to contaminate the evidence on the stairs, Detective Primo uses a ladder to get his first look at the carnage. Large amounts of blood. Just horrendous. A double homicide. Leslie Mazzara and Adrian Insonia, both 26. I always live by the rule of the crime scene's always at least twice the size as what it appears. Outside the house, one of the first pieces of evidence Detective Primo finds is a pile of cigarette butts. They didn't appear to be weathered. Um, they didn't appear to have been there for a long time. The lone survivor of the vicious attack is 28-year-old Lauren Mianza. The bedrooms of Adrian and Leslie are on the second floor. Lauren's bedroom is on the first floor at the back of the house. I got a phone call, so I went into my room and uh, took it, and I heard Adrian say goodnight, and that was about 10, I think. I went to bed about 11, and probably by 11, 11.30, the house was pretty quiet. By midnight, the young women are sound asleep. I'd never heard anything like it. I knew right away that it was something awful. And then I went to my door and stood kind of in the doorway under the stairs. I heard a male flying down the stairs. I figured I was next, not knowing what to do. I just <laughs> ran into the backyard. I have never, ever felt that terrified, like I was in a horror movie. I thought I was going to die. It was quiet except for screaming. I heard him kind of leave the house. Adrian, which I knew was her voice, uh, she'd stopped screaming, but she was calling out for help. There was blood everywhere. Adrian just lying down next to her bed. She was alive still, but she was, I could tell in her eyes, she was gone. I had never really seen someone die before. To the right of Adrian was Leslie lying face down in a pile of clothing. I just turned around and went down the stairs, and I called 911. In a few minutes' time, my entire life was changed. I'd lost my friends and my roommates, and I'd been left untouched. The only one who lived to tell the tale, police turned to Lauren for answers. Who would want to kill her roommates? Leslie Mazzara had moved to Napa about six months ago and landed a job at the vineyard of Hollywood legend, Francis Ford Coppola. Leslie was very, very outgoing and very spunky. I had never met anyone like her. Just warm and just southern hospitality, everything. Guys really liked her. Everybody kind of was drawn to her. Adrian and Sonia grew up in the area. 
and was an engineer for the city of Napa. Adrian was different. She was much more um, just mellow, um, very good friend to people, just very smart individual. These girls were tremendously well-liked, had tons and tons of friends, very social. There was no obvious motive that stood out as to why this crime may have happened. This was not going to be an easy case to solve. For days, crime scene investigators worked the house. The killer entered through a push-up window. There, they find fibers and what they hope is his blood. Nothing appears stolen. He's left no fingerprints and no weapon. All the evidence is sent for testing. Well, the first reaction from the community was just shock and disbelief that something like this could happen in our quiet little Napa. Marsha Dorgan covered the story for the Napa Valley Register. People were worried, they were scared. I mean, they didn't know if they had a serial killer out there running around. But the police don't think the murders were random. They think this is a crime of passion. A pattern of the blood evidence that was collected, the anger and aggression. The autopsy results support their theory. Cause of death, multiple stab wounds. Focus was that uh, the killer may have been um, an acquaintance or someone known to uh, Leslie, as Leslie did leave a more active social life. Leslie just attracted males. She had a lot of men interested in her. Two weeks later, the town of Napa holds a candlelight vigil for the two murdered women. Police methodically question hundreds of their male acquaintances, starting with their inner circle. But after three weeks, the police are no closer to identifying the killer. Daylight savings had, had started, so our days were very short, unfortunately. So any darkness, I just, I couldn't stand. Lauren and I, um, uh, from the day of this incident, uh, we met uh, or talked on the phone daily. Lauren was very eager and very helpful in the investigation and wanted to be kept abreast. So much evidence to process and so many potential suspects, the police are overwhelmed. And then something unexpected. A friend of Lauren's makes an appointment with two L.A. psychics, Marty and Michael Perry. Allie had called me to let me know she was going to see the Perrys go have a, a reading with them. She said that she would call me afterwards and let me know how it went. The Perrys work as a team. Marty, an artist, claims to sketch what the spirits show her. It's almost like automatic drawing. I get images of the people on the other side. And very often, I'll have artists on the other side work through me. I'm in control, but I'm not. Michael claims to channel them. A medium's purpose is to be the vessel through which a deceased person communicates to a living person without getting in the way. It's like conscious possession. I'm there with you, but I'm not. Allie records the session and tells them nothing about the murdered women. Michael Perry appears to fall into a trance. I have two people here. One says my first name is A. She took that party. They said their life was taken. I can feel stabs up here around my neck or my neck's cut. Murder, the same murder. Two young women are stabbed to death in their Napa Valley home while a third roommate escapes. 400 miles away, a pair of psychics claim to receive messages from the spirits of the murdered women. Michael got on the phone and he said, I, I need to speak with you. And we set up an appointment for um, a phone interview or reading. Marty and Michael felt that they could possibly help out in our investigation. I told Laura that I was open for anything. A month after the murders, a phone reading is arranged. Lauren takes notes while Michael and Marty Perry record the session. Marty allows spirits to guide her hand as she begins to sketch. 
while Michael enters a trance and establishes contact with the murdered women, Leslie Mazzara and Adrian and Sonia. You know, she's the loudest one. She's, she's the, the talker to me. Michael had told me that Adrian was coming through more clearly. She had a very analytical mind. So she was definitely in the forefront of everything, whereas Leslie kind of stood back. She says you to say you'd be dead too. You understand? Adrian knew that I had left the house. She would have not known I would have left the house unless she was already past and seeing things. Michael claims to see the female police officer who first arrived at the murder scene. She couldn't take it or didn't want to be in there. She left, didn't she? This is what she says. When I heard that, I was very surprised, and I looked over to Kirk, and I said, did that happen? And he said, yes, that, that kind of sealed it for me. You know, I had goosebumps just like she did. Those were details that were not released. Those were details that were kept very uh, private as to not inhibit the investigation. All this time, Marty Perry has been sketching the face of a man. I did ask the girls on the other side to send me an image of the perpetrator. The biggest feeling was the goatee. When I, when I get a facial hair I, I, and I'm drawing it, I start itching all over the place. And that's what I was getting when I was drawing that. After the session, they emailed it to, to me. And uh, I remember looking at it, it actually looked familiar. I wasn't sure why. Could this be a portrait of the killer? Detective Primo adds the sketch to the case file in hopes it will trigger something. Uh, this could be for real. Perry's were interested in coming up and, and meeting with us in person, and so um, he definitely wanted to pursue that. DNA results from the blood taken at the crime scene identify three people, Leslie, Adrian, and what police believe is the killer, a white male. But these women were very popular women, and they had tons and tons of friends. Leslie had uh, ties to so many different cities and, and states that they had to do all of that, and they just interviewed people. Police ask all of the women's male friends to provide voluntary DNA samples. There was several pools of individuals uh, to be interviewed and to be sampled. It wasn't just a local police department investigation. There were several state and federal agencies involved. There was a lot of high and lows um, periods during the investigation when um, we felt that we might have somebody whose DNA was eventually going to come back and be a match to what we had. Um, and then there was a lows when those didn't. Over the next six weeks, DNA results eliminate suspect after suspect. Police are no closer to catching the killer. We knew we had um, what it was going to take to link our assailant to the crime. Um, it was just finding that assailant looking for anything that might help to solve the case. The police meet with the psychic couple, this time in Napa. Michael Perry claims to connect once more with one of the murdered girls, Adrian. I said to Lauren, who's Lily? Lauren can only think of Lily Prudhomme, Adrian's best friend. They work together. Um, very closely, so they um, knew each other well from that. Adrian, um, when I met her, lived across the street from Lily. The two were so close that Lily had postponed her wedding so that she and Adrian could travel together. But what could Lily have to do with the murders? There was no way that I even would second guess any Lily or anyone related to Lily being involved with this crime. It was something I completely dismissed. Um, I didn't even write it down in my notes. Focus was more on Leslie. So anyone kind of on Adrian's side was um, not as heavily focused on. So there weren't a lot of um, flags going up at all. Lauren felt just as I did that it was um, just Adrian's best friend and that it really didn't have any significance other than Adrian was trying to maybe get a message to uh, Lily. Maybe there are more answers at the house. Lauren was clearly traumatized. You could see it. Yeah, she, she didn't was... want to go to the house. I quickly learned my limitations on what I could give and what I couldn't. Even before the police officer and the psychics enter the house, Michael Perry claims to key into the crime. I said, oh, there are blood splats that you found out on the porch. I said, that's his blood. And he said, yes, we believe so. I said, oh, the window opened up. 
And he climbed in through the windows and he found blue fibers on the windowsill. Kirk said yes. Inside, no evidence of that horrific night remains. Michael Perry goes straight upstairs. I knew immediately which room it had happened in. Michael ran his hand along the banister and it stopped and said that he believed the killer's blood had been located um, on the banister in these locations. And in fact, that is where it had been found. So we stood in the room for a while, and of course, there was nothing there. It had all been cleaned out. I remember saying to him, you found one girl here, and you found the other girl here, didn't you? And he said, yes. Adrian was doing most of the communicating with me, and she told me that the other girl had been stabbed first. Then attacked Adrian. She put up a big struggle. Then, Michael Perry says what the police already suspect. I strongly felt that it was someone they absolutely knew. There was no question about it in my mind that they knew this person. He has one more message from Adrian. She kept referencing a boyfriend. Months after the stabbing deaths of two young roommates in Napa, a pair of psychics give police a name they claim comes from the dead women themselves. The name, Lily. Adrian's best friend, Lily, um, who was engaged at the time to a gentleman by the name of Eric Koppel, had come over and done some work on the dryer at the residence. Eric Koppel's name had um, not surfaced. Um, an interview actually had been done with Lily, his um, fiance, who was a co-worker of Adrian's. The police have interviewed over a 1,000 men but not the 26-year-old land surveyor, Eric Koppel. I added him to my checklist. He was the 11th item on the checklist um, to make contact with him, to do an interview and obtain a voluntary DNA sample. When I first saw the picture of Eric, um, the first thing that stood out was the sketch that uh, Marty and Michael had provided and how accurate it was, looking almost identical to Eric. Um, it also put pieces together, such as what Lily meant, before he can interview Lily's boyfriend, Eric Koppel, Detective Primo is taken off the case. My rotation to rotate out of investigations was about to come up. Uh, I created this checklist uh, to which I passed on to the incoming detective. Um, the list was never followed up upon, and Eric was never contacted. The investigation inched along for nearly a year. Leads dried up, and no more tips were coming in. Lots of community pressure, um, lots of community uncertainty, and the pressure was that we need to solve this. And no one wanted answers more than Lauren Mianza. I was fearful that it would, would just be forgotten about, I think, and become a cool case. It was finally decided through the department that we would go ahead and reveal the brand of cigarette that had been collected and sampled DNA um, the night of the homicide, a rare brand um, and one that had been introduced uh, not long before the crime had occurred. DNA on the cigarette butts matches the DNA of the blood found at the crime scene. Blood, the police believe, belongs to the murderer. We didn't associate with any smokers, and then I stopped. I thought, you know, Lily smokes, and so does her boyfriend at the time, and they, they smoked. So I gave, um, gave them Eric Koppel's name. September 22, 2005, the police released the distinctive brand of cigarettes to the media, Camel Turkish Gold, Eric Koppel's brand. Five days later, accompanied by his now wife, Lily, the quiet land surveyor turns himself in. I was shocked at first, and then it kind of made sense. He didn't stick out, but he kind of just survived under large personality of Lily. No one in the community, and especially people that knew him, thought that Eric was ever a suspect, let alone a killer. Eric Matthew Koppel is charged with two counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances, lying in wait and using a knife. He was fearful of losing Lily. He was fearful that Adrian was convincing Lily to leave him. And their wedding had been called off, and he blamed Adrian. Adrian and Lily had planned a trip to Australia together. And so he was just deathfully afraid of losing her. So his answer was, kill the one that's in the 
in the way of my happiness with Lily. Kill the problem. On Halloween night 2004, Eric Koppel admits he drank heavily at a party, during which he quarreled with Lily. A few hours later, armed with a knife, he entered the house on Dorset Street through an unlocked window. He creeps upstairs, and at this point, the sequence of the attack is only known to Eric. But in the end, Adrian and Leslie lay dying in Adrian's room after being repeatedly stabbed. Adrian was the intended target. It seems Leslie Mazzara may have died trying to help her friend. Still today, I, I can speculate on why he didn't touch me or, you know, he avoided my room. I'm not sure. It's always a good question, so. January 2007, more than two years after the murders, the quiet land surveyor faces the court. Can you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty, Your Honor. His wife, Lily, who the Perrys had named as key to the case, was there at his sentencing. Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. I am a broken man. Oh, that sucks. A man splintered <clears throat> by a penetrating awareness of my own potential for wickedness. And it is ordered Eric Matthew Coppola is to serve a life sentence without possibility of parole. Finally, some closure for the family and friends. I was just so thankful that, that there had been a resolution to everything. After having gone through this and having the experience of working with mediums, don't overlook. Uh, they may be a very good asset to uh, your investigation, and at least they may be a small piece to that puzzle that you're missing. I felt Adrian was a very strong uh, personality, a very determined girl and that she was determined to put this guy away or do something about it. And that's what we do this for, is to help heal people, help um, realize that there is another side and uh, that we don't die. The first night when I was questioned, I asked, what do people in my situation generally do? And Kirk had said, people don't generally survive in, in this situation. They're usually killed too. The experience with the Perrys has given me a faith that that after we pass, that we can still have a connection to the ones we've loved in this lifetime.